Hello out there. Hi. I'm Sincerely B. Hanging out. Uh, you can see I'm playing some Magic the Gathering Arena. I'm gonna do something a little different. I got some articles and stuff that I'm gonna share, read through some videos from uh, content creator, second thought, friend of the show, friend of the channel. Um, really excited about some of that. And um, some other articles to talk about, go through, play some games, hang out, chill. Um, get ready for Tabletop Tuesday tonight. Turn of rep and a whole new Tabletop Tuesday night, which is going to be a lot of fun. Really excited about. See what's going on. I'm, I'm new to the... Uh, the Magic the Gathering experience, seeing how we're doing here. Started getting into MTG. This up. On this week's episode of Hey, stop it right now. Presented by Second Thought, we're going to look at Hollywood's crucial role in the military industrial complex. From Marxist analysis of superstructure to FOIA documents and the propaganda of the American Office of War. What? Other people are aware of the things that are going on in the world? No. Who would have thought? Uh, I mean. JT from Second Thought coming in strong right off the top, letting us know um, what we can expect here. I think uh, I appreciate that, JT, because we are not allowed to enjoy media anymore. Uh, media bad. Um, because the military is involved with it all. Manufacturing consent is real. It's a thing. Fixy fix here real quick. Bring that down. Oh yeah, make this a little bit better for our viewing experience. Make myself a little smaller. Appreciate everybody's patience. While we figure make some small adjustments for everybody's viewing patience. Yo, what's up, Pacifist War Vet? What's up? We're watching some second thought. Uh, playing some uh, uh, Magic the Gathering, getting ready for tonight's uh, uh, Tabletop Tuesday, just a casual stream, going over some of the uh, stuff that we're reading, some articles, videos, whatnot, catching up with uh, Second Thought right now, uh, a couple weeks ago, this has been on the um, agenda to cover on channel for a little bit, is how Hollywood sells us war from Second Thought. Uh, really appreciate their content. They've been on the show before. So, I'm going to do that. It's, it's a good day. It's a good day out there. Start this back up. For information, we're going to examine how it is that the American disease of perpetual war gains public support from our film industry. Come on, it's going to be fun. We're doing a Marxist analysis of Shrek, but for all of Hollywood. So, where do we start? Well, a good place to begin talking about all of this is with the Department of Defense's direct involvement in Hollywood movies' depiction of the United States and its armed forces. To be clear, if you go to the DOD's website, they are very upfront about the fact that they are involved in Hollywood productions and in the way scripts for major blockbusters are written. What you might not expect is the, let's say, interesting way they like to phrase that involvement. Here's what the website reads. The Defense Department has a long-standing relationship with Hollywood. In fact, it's been working with filmmakers for nearly 100 years. Production agreements require the DOD to be able to review a rough cut of the film, so officials can decide if there are areas that need to be <clears throat> addressed before a film is released. While Hollywood is paid to tell a compelling story that will make money, the DOD is looking to tell an accurate story. Sure. We'll get to that last part in a second. But first, Really, I'm on a side eye that that all of that. I'm side eyeing it all. 
there's a side eye. I can't help it. So sorry. The side eye is real. What? Hmm. All right. We should get an idea of the actual scale of DOD involvement. In a series of publicly accessible documents, you can get a list of all the movies and TV shows that the DOD admits publicly to have contributed to or denied assistance. The list goes back decades, and what's great about it is that there are little notes about what the DOD changed in each of these movies or the reasons they were refused assistance. For a good number of these movies, it's very clear that in return for access to military equipment and locations, which would otherwise be incredibly costly to reproduce for even big budget studios, certain storylines and dialogues were altered or removed entirely. I've already talked on this channel about the media wing of the US military, specifically its influence on Twitch and in animated shorts targeting Gen Z in this video. Now that's a nice video. Boy, I love that video. You better watch that video after you're done with this video, I'll tell you right now. You won't forget, right? But that episode is focused on rec uh, I actually should bring that back up and we should watch that episode again. That should be like a weekly start of the week showing of that recruiting. Second While thought that video. is a major goal of the military's propaganda campaigns and it's meant to make war institutions look wholesome and good, it's really just one part of a much bigger project. And it's also much more obvious what's going on. It's the military saying how the military is great on its own platform not on someone else's platform like a big budget Hollywood movie. What the FOIA documents reveal is the much more subtle ways, the insinuations, the detailed rewrites that don't necessarily make the military look great, but that gloss over the realities that make it look bad or that make sure more critical movies have a harder time getting produced, that they don't get access to the privileges the pro-military movies do. From the military's point of view, this kind of favoritism makes complete sense. Why would they promote a movie that makes them look bad by accurately reflecting the imperialist project the US has undertaken, especially since the end of the Second World War? They wouldn't, and they don't. The result of this favoritism is that the films that do get DOD support paint a pretty uniform image of the US military as heroic and exemplary in most cases, and only accidentally ineffective but ultimately well-meaning at the very most critical end of the spectrum. And because these pro-military movies end up saving so much on production cost and get access to military equipment and facilities for shoots, they are far more likely to get produced and to become blockbusters. It's the case for some MCU movies. It's Top Gun. It's Bond movies like Tomorrow Never Dies. Those are the movies that get DOD support and that get the cleanup treatment. Now, to be clear, movies that portray the military apparatus more accurately, with less of a rose-tinted hue, are still going to be made. But without State Department support, they might not reach the same blockbuster status as often or to such a degree as their more profitable box office neighbors. Surprisingly, the DOD's goal is incredibly transparent. Philip Strubb, director of entertainment media at the US Department of Defense, said it pretty plainly. Our desire is that the military are portrayed as good people trying to do the right thing the right way. That's probably our single most important imperative. And That's... That... That just outright... That sentence on its own just outright means that they are promoting a biased look at... At the... At what the military's does their 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 desire is to present a biased look because the military does isn't always doing right for this talk about it all the time on the channel here and so this is just a, a thing that we need to discuss is that if the military is involved in it they are shaping the conversation to justify their usage usage of the military. And to make sure that it does happen that way, military organizations are willing to leverage the billions they have at their disposal in the form of military equipment and shoot locations to keep the movies on that line of the military can do no wrong. Here's another quote, this time from Robert Anderson, the Navy's Hollywood relations person. If you want full cooperation from the Navy, we have a considerable amount of power because it's our ships. 
it's our cooperation. And until the script is in a form that we can approve, then the production doesn't go forward. So, you know, that's the military's media relations team openly admitting to using Hollywood as a vehicle for pro-military propaganda. No big deal. But concretely, what does this influence look like? What needs to change for a script to be approved? To answer those questions, you could use literally hundreds of films and TV shows in that database, and the countless examples of how lines that don't exactly fit into the US's narrative have been, let's say, tweaked. For the sake of brevity, let's just take a couple. In the movie 12 Strong, DOD rewrites were minor cleaning up the physical image of the protagonist and taking homophobic slurs out of their dialogue to present a more sanitized image of the elite American soldier. In the movie Lone Survivor, not so much. Rewrites included removing the main character's urge to commit war crimes and murder civilians while in Afghanistan. In the real story, no war crimes were committed. Yep, you heard that right. people like glossing over the history of, of the heroic um deals and people that get that get lifted up by the culture of military glory which enables it for them um Committed, let this but play. they were considered by the military officer who ended up writing the book the movie was based on. In the movie, the protagonist has a clear conscience. No war criminal thoughts here, no sir. In Charlie Wilson's War, a movie meant to comedically recount the story of the U.S. arming the Mujahideen, the sanitized, approved script removes from the original any mention of the U.S.'s support leading, at least in part, to the power Al-Qaeda and the Taliban would eventually accumulate. Sometimes it's a small rewrite, sometimes it's a big rewrite. Every time, though, the rewrite conceals some part of the truth, because the truth doesn't look good. These are just a few examples sourced from this article. There are hundreds more. And okay, look, I know how this sounds. It sounds like I'm peddling a conspiracy. How could something so clearly objectionable be going on with no one doing anything about it? These are possibly violations of the First Amendment. Government-sanctioned speech receiving preferential treatment is a problem, and the fact that it's being carried out by the U.S. government itself to justify war? That seems like too big a deal not to be a bigger controversy. On my side of things, it feels weird, and probably does for you too, that to make my case I'm pulling up FOIA documents and sending you to websites you've probably never seen before. I get that. No offense to the Mint Press team, you guys do excellent work. Regardless of the evidence I have presented here, or the fact that much of it is coming directly from the mouths of the people involved, or that several articles linked in the description are published in mainstream media, it's going to sound like I'm some tinfoil hat-wearing nut. The thing is, you don't have to believe me on this one fact, that the DoD is censoring Hollywood scripts, to be convinced that Hollywood as a whole is an institution that promotes the interests of the military-industrial complex. Even if the DoD had never addressed its involvement in the script writing of today's blockbusters, which we've seen it does, the existence of the beneficial relationship between our military and our entertainment industry is plain as day. And you can thank two pieces of evidence for that. The history of military propaganda in the US, and thematic analyses of the last decade's most popular movies. Roll clip. After the United States enters the war in April 1917, President Woodrow Wilson knows that he needs to mobilize not just the American army, but the American people. And he knows that's a difficult task. So what Wilson does is he launches a massive campaign of propaganda that taps into every media that's available in America at the time. This includes newspapers, movies, posters, toys and games for children, all aspects of popular culture. That's a short clip from the National World War I Museum and Memorial YouTube channel. The rest of the video is in the description. What the host is talking about here is the propaganda efforts of the Committee on Public Information, a US agency that sprung up during the First World War. Posters, news articles, everywhere Americans looked, they were being sold the war effort by their government, including in movies. And wouldn't you know it, it really worked. Most Americans were on board with the war just years after many were firmly opposed to American involvement or simply disinterested. 
Movies like the animated short The Sinking of the Lusitania galvanized American public support for the war, presenting U.S. entry into the conflict as a moral duty, rather than getting the country to rally behind the more accurate and crucial role that war profiteering played in the decision to ship soldiers abroad. Less relevant to the war, but a great example of this sort of propaganda effort, is the white supremacist movie The Birth of a Nation, widely credited to have revived the KKK in the early 20th century. As it happens, that movie was the first Hollywood venture to receive military support, according to Tam. And you'll see it's a really helpful. So it's interesting that like at the turn of the century, they're, they are aware of media's of the power of motion pictures and the immersive quality of it. And, and we're, we're sitting here talking about like game gamers for peace, the tie into the military and why they use gaming as a means of recruiting it's an outgrowth of all that it's all the same stuff helpful concept we can use to break this stuff down to be very very brief about it superstructures in marxist analysis are the elements of our society that aren't directly economic law media culture religion education whatever you want if it's something that molds or represents a form of ideology, some ideas we can have about the world, it's probably going to be part of the superstructure. Let's focus on culture. According to Marxist theorists, the production of cultural texts, like movies, is rooted in and influenced by the economic context in which it appears, and in a mutually reinforcing way, can often come to justify and support that economic situation. TLDR, not only does the idea behind the creation of a random movie get influence from its environment, that's not too difficult to imagine, so too does its ability to be distributed widely, to reach many people, to interest an audience. It needs to be relevant to someone to get made, and so will often find relevance by reaffirming the present societal order. In a neoliberal, imperial, capitalist society like the US, which has lived war to war for close to a century, it should be pretty obvious that war is going to feature prominently in our culture. It makes it into so many films, not just because it satisfies someone's monetary interest when it does, but because we couldn't not talk about it. The sinister part of that inevitable truth about media in a society is that the military's influence on media in our society is so large, meaning that even if we want to talk about war more critically, that type of cultural production will always be at a disadvantage. But okay, let's assume that there wasn't any military influence at all, that the DOD had never, and to this day does not give a leg up to pro-army movies or effectively censor its critics. If you look at the biggest blockbusters of the last decade, you'll have an incredibly easy time finding that they glorify or offer only weak, superficial critiques to the military apparatus and its logic of imperialism. Look, I'm not a film critic, by the way. Just like you, I watch stuff with my friends, point to the TV screen, and say, that's actually a metaphor for capitalism, and look down while everybody rolls their eyes. But I don't have to be a good film critic. I have YouTube. Both this video by the channel Skip Intro and this one by the channel Just Right are great and thorough breakdowns of the way American exceptionalism and imperialism come to be justified in a prototypical example of pro-military media. The Captain America movies The First Avenger and The Winter Soldier, two movies that unsurprisingly benefited from a close collaboration with the DoD. Throughout the films, America's role as a global superpower, embodied in Steve Rogers' character, is hardly interrogated. He has great power, but he's being a very responsible little man and doesn't abuse it because he's just a good dude and so is America, by the way. Just trust me on that one. Come on, guys. Would I ever lie to you about this? No, of course not. 
So in these movies, when US institutions are brought under scrutiny and the heroes turn against S.H.I.E.L.D., the organization meant to represent the Department of Homeland Security, the only real problem the movie ends up portraying with the institution is that it was infiltrated by the evil Hydra. S.H.I.E.L.D. in and of itself Dan for was Nazis. always okay. We just need to get rid of the baddies and then we can get back to the completely justified global police stuff. Those are just two movies. But these kinds of messages are rife in American cinema and are discussed a lot more thoroughly in the videos I've linked in the description. And the reason I'm even talking about this is that the result of all these thematic implications is that the overall picture we get of the US and its military efforts is not one characterized by the greed behind domination of oil or other natural reserves in the Middle East, the subjugation or outright murder of civilians by military occupation and drone strikes, or the unjustifiable interventions made to oust popular and democratically elected leaders across the world. Thanks to Hollywood, the military almost exclusively looks like a force for good, an industry we can keep justifying giving nearly a trillion dollars to every year so that the Lockheed Martins and Boeings of the world can continue driving up their stock prices. 55% of our bloated military budget that was just expanded goes to private military contractors and, and industry companies that do not directly relate to the military or, or, or the men and women and people in, in uniform. Um, that goes to wasted projects like green electric Humvees and green well, low energy output light bulbs on submarines, greenwashing our nuclear program, and 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 continuing mineral extraction and the war on cl the climate um 55 percent of that budget goes towards that just saying not saying just putting that out there that's it. Nothing else. Nothing else to say. Movies have powerful Sorry, I had to make that sick ass play. propaganda potential. And in giving us only weak tools to critique the military, if any at all, they have successfully allowed for the continuous American support for Hey Rebel for Peace. Thanks for joining. Awesome. I'll check out that uh link in just a second. Awesome having you here. For its most massive imperial project to date. Of course, as media consumers, we're not just passive propaganda sponges. But in the absence of good, popular critiques, and under a barrage of pro-military propaganda, even our best defenses can weaken over time. Just something to keep in mind. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that this episode is made possible by Fabulous. Let me tell you why. As I've told you all before, it's pretty hard to get sponsors on my channel. That's partly due to the nature of my content, and partly because I'm very picky regarding what brands I'll work with. I get a lot of comments about how my content can be kind of depressing, which is true. I tackle a lot of heavy topics. I have been trying to add more humor recently, but there's no avoiding the fact that talking about major problems can be disheartening or overwhelming. One way I combat these feelings is by trying to maintain healthy habits, like going to the gym, making sure I drink plenty of water, stuff like that. So when I got the offer to work with Fabulous, it was a no-brainer. If you haven't heard of Fabulous, it's an app based on behavioral science that helps you build and maintain healthy habits. 
What I like about it is that it's 100% personalized. It doesn't force you into one style of habit building. You have options based on your preferred approach. You can either tell the app exactly what habits you want to focus on, or you can use Journeys, specially crafted habit building programs that guide you towards your goals. One thing that sets Fabulous apart is that it's actually backed by science. It's not just vague self-improvement mumbo jumbo, this is concrete stuff that you can do to develop healthy habits that will stick. There's a reason Fabulous is the number one self-care app for building better habits and achieving your goals. It's because it works. Personally, I've been using Fabulous to make stretching part of my daily routine. It's done wonders to fix my editing back pain and to improve my overall feeling of accomplishment just by checking that off my list every morning. Like I said, I don't work with a sponsor unless I 100% believe in their mission and their product. And Fabulous has earned that recommendation. As an added perk for fans of Second Thought, if you're one of the first 100 people to sign up using the link below, you can get 25% off Fabulous Premium, which comes with some really cool added features, like daily coaching and unlimited habits in your routines. So if you'd like to join me in overcoming those feelings of anxiety or depression, I highly recommend you give Fabulous a shot. It works, and it really does help support me and the content I produce. Check it out by following the link in the description. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous videos by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week. All right. Y'all here, take no purchase rebro rebroadcast on Reveal Radio. Center of Investigate Report on January 9th. I actually discussed last season how common and what since have not. Um, I just saw you drop that link. I'm going to check them out. I'll pull it up on stream in just a, a couple minutes, but, um, have, have not checked out, uh, revealnews.org, but, uh, interested in looking at that. Thanks for sharing that. It's talking about the military industrial complexes. Is, is, it's pervasive. Like it is every place that we're dealing with stuff. And uh, I'm about to lose this, but like, where where do we pushing back on this is one of the utmost important. It's one of the things that we have to do. I don't know. I'm not a big brain person. I'm just a guy, just a pal, just a friend. I'm just a concerned person that like doesn't want other kids and people to go through the war experience and I want to address the issues that that are caused like like humanity is suffering the earth is suffering because of the American war experience and because of American militarism um and uh yeah I'm not a fan of uh of letting this continue so I'm gonna check out reveal news in a second we got a couple more videos and stuff to go through um so going back and forth between some games and some and stuff if we keep running uh inside of a stream kind of antics going on here
maybe asking yourself, what are you What are you doing, Sin? What's going on? Play this game. Helps develop some of them skills. Called a eternal return. Doesn't really help you develop deep thinking skills. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. I might want to talk about that and just have fun playing this stuff. Uh, it was refreshing to have a good turnout to demo observing 20th anniversary of Gitmo today. Folks are repressed, but freedom fight against militarism will rebound in spring. Keep it up. Great tack you're taking. Thanks so much for Rebel. Thank you so much. Thank you for being there at that 20th anniversary. How'd that go? Tell me about it. Uh, you got a link? Uh, or who was all there? What orgs? Share something about that. I'd, I'd love to. A lot of great stuff going on out in in the world right now like that's talking about these issues and trying to uh address this stuff so i'm gonna start up our next video i'm gonna play actually i'm gonna play a game of eternal return and then i'll start up the next video we can in the meantime get oh actually if I can play Fortress on a Hill. Speak of the devil. an answer back from uh, Fortress on a Hill in a little bit. Chat, let me know if that's readable, if if the chat is still readable for you guys. Uh, but I'm going to start up the next video. Another Second Thought video. Uh, second Thought, JT over at Second Thought does amazing work. This is a episode from January 7th, Why American Fascism is on the Rise. You know, we talk about the Hollywood propaganda. We just came from Second Thought's Hollywood propaganda video. We talk about the, the usage of gaming-adjacent spaces by the military to promote recruiting. And the bleed over that occurs into national like extremism and violent violent extremism in gaming spaces, um, a result of that military influence setting the standard and culture of gaming early on, and still what they promote in order to, to push that the what the the traits that the military wants. So we talk about that, but we never talk about the kids that don't get recruited but are groomed to glorify the military and get picked up in these uh, gaming-adjacent spaces by some extremist groups. Um, yeah, Rebel, I'll catch you later. Thanks for sharing that. I'm going to be bringing that stuff up in a little bit on stream um, and uh, talking about it. Thanks for joining us. Really appreciate having you here. See you.
there we go. Here's that revealnews.org. Uh, Palace Spear facing on a number of problems. Every one of these crises stand benefit from them all. At Reveal, we pour necessary time and resources into unearthing original stories that hold people and institutions accountable for the problems they've caused or benefited from. Investigative reporting consistently contributes to real-world impact from civil and criminal investigations to news, laws, and policies, better informed conversations, and community-driven solutions. Nonprofit, our bottom line is the public interest. We have the courage, freedom, and independence to dedicate our entire newsroom to this work because we're powered by supporters from foundations, individual donors, and readers and listeners like you. Checking out. Just based off everybody's headshot, these people are amazing. That's what I'm going with. There's so much wisdom and intelligence in everybody's eyes. I mean that. Conflict beef from Nicaragua feeds U.S. market amid pandemic. That's the truth. Truth about injuries at Amazon. Take no prisoner. Right. I'm not going to get into the transcript, but let's see. Let's listen. Or he, read this. In December 1944, Frank Hartzels was a young soldier pressed into fierce fighting during the Battle of Bulge. Was there battling Nazi soldiers for control of the Belgian town of Chinogu? And was there afterward? And was there afterward when dozens of unarmed German prisoners of war were gunned down in the field? Reporter Chris Harlan Dunaway travels to Belgium to tour Chinon with Belgian historian Roger Marquette. Then he sits down with Bill Johnson, a military historian, a former dean of the Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, to talk why the patent papers don't accurately reflect. General George S. Patton's diary entries at all. The massacre at Chenong happened soon after the Malmedy massacre, during which Nazi troops killed unarmed American POWs. The German soldiers responsible were tried at Dachau, but the American soldiers who committed the massacre at Chenong were never held accountable. Harlan Dunaway interviews Ben Ferengs the last surviving lawyer from the Nuremberg trials about why the Americans escaped justice. And finally, Harlan Dunaway returns to Hartzell to explain what he's learned and to press Hartzell for a full accounting of his role that day in Chen Long. Ooh. Actually, I'm kind of listening to that now. Like, right this moment. Um, Before I get into that, so we're going to do um, why Ma American fascism is on the rise. Okay, we're going to do why American fascism is on the rise, uh, and then probably listen to that podcast. There's something I also want to read, talking about whistleblowing. It's a whole other aspect to this conversation. It's a really good um, 
thing I want to read um, from this book, Whistleblowing for Change. Um, the chapter I want to talk about in there, talking about our networks. And uh, Network Exposed, written by Lisa Lang and Chine, uh, Sean uh, Westmoreland, or Love. Um, they're doing excellent work. I wanted to go over that. And then we also got an opinion came out today about Afghanistan. Got a little bit of time. And then we'll talk about crows being self-aware. Um, yeah, crows are self-aware. So we're going to continue with this. Let's go back to JT. Love JT's content. This JT, keep doing the work. And like are made possible. JT, if, if, if you do catch catch this and um just let me know if uh i hope you i hope i hope jt doesn't yell at us for for doing hot takes and shares of his amazing work over there at second thought his youtube channel uh you can see it right there um i ain't gonna be mad at you if you go support second thought over on his patreon youtube and all that stuff uh, he also has a podcast called D Program, which I highly recommend. It's really solid. Uh, yeah, this is what we talk about and what we're doing. So, well, by start the this generous up. support of my patrons on Patreon, we just did a major overhaul of our patrons-only Discord server. So, if you'd like to join our growing community and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at Patreon.com/slash/SecondThought. Remember January sixth. Of course you do. Remember, it was the day Antifa did everything Trump supporters had said they would be doing for months. Did it exactly the way they'd been planning and telling all their friends they'd be doing it in online forums. Did the whole thing while wearing MAGA shirts, waving Confederate flags, and having the names and faces of long-standing Republican voters grafted onto their own Mission Impossible style. And then Antifa chivalrously took none of the credit for it. Wow, what a memorable time in American history that was. It's been almost a year, or exactly one year, or, or just a little more than one year, I, I, I don't know, I'm writing this in December. Let's just say it's been about a year since the weirdest day in recent American history, and in the meantime, things haven't been super fun. The far right seems like it's continuing to grow in power and in influence under the Biden admin. And in this episode, we're going to be looking at that a little more closely, because it is a troubling omen for the future of politics in this country. Let's get started. The first thing I should address is the title of the video, the idea that fascism is on the rise in the US. That's a pretty obvious statement for most people, and likely even more so for the audience I have on this channel. Fascism has been on the rise for a while, so much so that it's made that very statement the topic of countless op-eds, and not too long ago, the most powerful government seat in the world was filled by the unwitting culmination of that trend. For four years, the United States was ruled by a man who repeatedly parroted fascist narratives, cozied up to white supremacist organizations, and used armed forces and a militarized police to quash anti-fascist protest movements. And those are just some of the many- The things Biden, or Obama did. Biden did. Clinton did. What? I'm sorry. But, like, everybody. Many, 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 everybody. many, many, many other telltale signs of fascism. There are just so many. I'm not going Bush, to spend Cheney. more time on this already tired argument of whether it's a fascist, a proto-fascist, a neo-fascist, or not a fascist at all, haha, don't worry about it, because you've had over four years of that and we're all sick of it. This video is about how the US as a whole is getting fascister, even more fascisty, how America is doing big fash. But just so it's out of the way, I'm going to be using the same definition of fascism I've used before, palingenetic ultranationalism. Palingenetic meaning a belief in and a desire for the violent rebirth of a nation to overcome a period of moral decay, and ultranationalism meaning an overwhelming loyalty to a perverted vision of one's country, often laced with bigotry and racism. There is more to fascism than that, and it varies by the culture in which it appears, but since we're talking about big trends in our common discourse, defining fascism by its core ideology like this is actually pretty useful. So with all that in mind, let's go back to January 6th. That day was a real turning point for the American far right, particularly in the months that followed it. On the one hand, it was the first time in several years that crackdowns had targeted white nationalists and their friends so aggressively. 
As I'm writing this, over 700 people have been arrested and charged for the acts committed on the day of the riots, and several trials are ongoing to identify central figures and prosecute them. Groups like the Proud Boys, who were involved in the event and reached superstar status in 2020 after this infamous clip. Stand back and stand by, but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left because this is not a right... These groups started to lose members in 2021. Whether it was because of mass deplatforming from Parler and other online cesspools for the far right, or because the group splintered after leader Enrique Tarrio was outed as an FBI informant, the Proud Boys <laughs> and groups like them could not and did not build the same size... I will never get tired of the cowardice of fascists and and um the leader of the proud boys is an fbi informant which begs the question like has anybody ever looked into the 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 way informantry works it's it's just getting people to do escalating crime and then getting to turn them over for rewards from the government like like it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that encourages informants to get others to do crime to be turned in yeah um just saying just saying like audience on telegram as they had achieved just a year earlier on other platforms but that seemingly downward trend is a very small part of the story. Not only have public shows of force by the far right increased, not only do already white supremacist police forces get infiltrated by even more extremist group members, the overall trajectory of the far right movement in the US in general has been growth, massive growth. And the reason the far right has grown so much is because it has successfully coalesced under a few key narratives that it has been able to mainstream in greater American political culture. The Proud Boys may not be what they used to, but it's because the American right as a whole has taken their place. <laughs> Take a look at this clip, taken from a community meeting in Shasta County, California. And, and you better be happy that we're, we're good citizens, that we're peaceful citizens. But it's not going to be peaceful much longer, okay? And this isn't a threat. I'm not a criminal. I've never been a criminal. But I'm telling you that good citizens are going to turn into real concerned and revolutionary citizens real soon. And nobody else is going to say that. I'm probably the only person that has a ball to say what I'm saying right now. That we're building, we're organizing, and we'll work with law enforcement or without law enforcement. But you won't stop us when time comes because our families are starving. And if you don't hear the seriousness of my voice, I hope you open your ears and you absolutely listen to what I'm saying. Because this is a warning for what's coming. It's not going to be peaceful much longer. It's not going to be raw raw. It's not going to be speeches. It's not going to be gathering outside saying Pledge of Allegiance. It's not going to be waving flags. It's going to be real. When you see the things that I've seen, I went to war for this country. I've seen the ugliest, dirtiest part of humanity. I've been in combat, and I never want to go back again. But I'm telling you what, I will to save this country. If it has to be against our own citizens, it will happen. And there's a million people like me. That is terrifying. As a veteran, in a veteran space that's advocating and talking about how, like, the veteran population is um at the forefront of of being the vehicles for change the fear that drives me in this space is that that vehicle for change that's led by veteran because of the glor military glorification because of the outrated privilege that and and um weight that the veteran voice has is going to take us to a violent place and that is why we cannot cannot allow uh, that to continue. It needs to be addressed and changed. I had no, ch no chance of survival there. But this guy terrifies me. And it's happening around the country. It is happening around the country a lot. That our drift in our politics amongst the mainstream population rooted in fear and an answer to violent to violence and a lot of people are scared and a lot of people are trained by the government in violence and then the what we just watched with manufacturing consent and the amount of propaganda that the military 
uh, has control over in our Hollywood and representations of itself fuels that. That recruiting pipeline is, I, I doubt somebody can convince me otherwise that the recruiting pipeline of the, the United States military is directly related to why Kyle Rittenhouse was able to be, was susceptible to, 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 to violent extremism and to do what he did. It's the glorification of the, the warrior culture within our society of the warfighter, of the defender, and, it, and then it gets co-opted. That, that glorification of somebody that's a community defender gets co-opted and placed into a realm of violent, like violent aggressor in order to be the defender. That it, it's, it is connected. The lack of education, the economic draft, all of these things are connected to the violence that's in our streets, connected to the 1033 program that the policing feels it gives them justification. It is a vicious cycle that starts and ends with war being a racket and capitalism running on blood. And we need to do something about it. We have to change the rules of the game by which we are playing if we all don't want to die. Or live in if we want to live in a functioning society that is inclusive, equitable, and promotes the thriving the the thrive capability to thrive for all life on Earth. We gotta change this American death cult. And you won't stop us. Open the county. Let our citizens do what they need to do. Let owners of businesses do what they need to do to feed their families. Take the masks off. That's a pretty troubling discourse, and as tempting as it might be to see this as a brief insight into a small movement, there's good evidence that the man in the video is just the most vocal part of the new American right. There's good evidence these beliefs aren't limited to militias with goofy names. They're an integral part of the conservative mob. Just take this statistic from the GWU program on extremism. Only around 13% of those charged in the Capitol riots were formal members of militant groups like the Proud Boys, the Three Percenters, and the Oath Keepers. The remaining 87% were a mix of typical Trump supporters and independent far-right extremists, there with their friends and family or lone attendees defined as inspired believers. That means most people who breached the Capitol were just average Republicans. And you can tell, these rioters just don't look like the typical far-right extremist. They are much older, with around two-thirds being over 35 years old, much less likely to be unemployed, and a full 14% of the attendees charged were business owners, and 30% were white-collar workers. These are not the typical far-right extremist demographics. These are just Republican constituency demographics. All that to say that the mainstream Republican Party has not only swept the violent far-right under its wing, it is comfortable embodying it itself. Okay, how did this happen? What are the narratives that have made their way out of smaller far-right cells and into common right-wing discourse? There are some you're probably already expecting, like the belief the election was stolen. That is a big one, and around 60% of the Republican Party does hold that to be true. To be fair, Yo, Arby, I just saw your thing. I did accept it. Point over a year, hitting them over the head with that one. I accept so it. You want to you want a duo? Of a small group's narrative making it big. A more concrete example of that phenomenon is the QAnon conspiracy. One in four Republicans buy into the QAnon conspiracy theory that a group of Satan-worshipping, cannibalistic, blood-sucking pedophiles is ruling the U.S. government. Plenty of people have looked into the movement's anti-Semitic tropes and its close proximity to neo-Nazi and white supremacist groups, so I won't spend more time on it here. But there's that. 25%. The more unexpected narrative making waves and bringing back that classic fascist flavor to the Republican Party is the Great Replacement Theory. By the way, this is probably a good time to mention this video definitely isn't making it through the algorithm. So if you feel inclined, my Patreon is in the description. Anyway, the Great Replacement Theory is a classic. Support friend of the show, friend of our channel, friend of the platform, friend of VFP and, and, and the movement, uh, second thought. Some some love. Sick among neo fascists, and it's pretty clear why. Put to paper in 2012 by French writer Renaud Camus, 
Nope, wrong Camus. This is the guy. The Great Replacement asserts that there is a plot, which really means they think it's a Jewish thing, that the white race and white culture, whatever that is, is disappearing because of immigration from majority non-white countries. Fascists, and I really do mean fascists here, believe this will bring some general persecution of white people. Because, of course, they can't imagine the world being run any differently than with one race subjugating another, while at the same time believing wholeheartedly that racism ended with Obama. In any case, this is the theory that motivated the Christchurch shooter Brendan Tarrant and the El Paso shooter Patrick Crucius. And it's a big wet pile of fascist garbage that has, unsurprisingly, historical trajectory going straight from World War II through the American Nazi Party, Europe's own fascist politicians, and has now found a home among a substantial chunk of the Republican electorate. Here's a clip of Tucker Carlson endorsing the theory on Fox, calling it by name and likening it to eugenics. An unrelenting stream of immigration, but why? Well, Joe Biden just said it, to change the racial mix of the country. That's the reason, to reduce the political power of people whose ancestors lived here and dramatically increase the proportion of Americans newly arrived from the third world. And then Biden went further. He said that non-white DNA... Just had a small realization about that. is the quote source of our strength imagine saying that this is the language of eugenics it's horrifying but there's a reason biden said it in political terms this policy is called the great replacement the replacement of legacy americans with more obedient people from faraway countries they brag about it all the time but if you dare to say it's happening they will scream at you with maximum hysteria that is America's most watched conservative casually parroting an openly white supremacist theory on primetime TV. But what does this have to do with January 6th? According to UChicago professor Robert Papp, between 4 and 8 percent, or around 21 million Americans at the high end, believe both 1. that the election was stolen, and that 2. Trump should be reinstated by force. Of that group, 63 percent believe in the Great Replacement Theory almost 10% more than believe in QAnon, whose flags we saw waved throughout the crowd on January 6th and at every Trump rally for over a year. Let me say that again. More people in that crowd hold a deeply fascist belief than believe in the other slightly more wacky letter of the alphabet based fascist belief. And we know that the Q crowd was a big part of the Trump fan base to start off with because they're just so open about it. The great replacement crowd is just not waving as many flags. It is 18 more letters than a big Q, though. Anyway, more than just getting some demographic information, Papp was able to estimate that, among all other motivations, a belief in the Great Replacement was the most significant trigger that turned people already convinced that the election was stolen into people who believed that they should engage in insurrectionist violence to reinstate Trump. In other words, the belief that white people are being replaced is the motivator that justified the riots for its perpetrators. 
and with these narratives making their way to the most watched conservative TV show and to regular conservative conferences since January 6th, we might be in for an even worse time going forward. But the QAnon and Great Replacement stuff isn't the whole picture. In the last year, opposition to vaccine and mask mandates have functioned in much the same way, rallying together the various strands of the American far right to the somewhat more moderate Republican base and infusing a more authoritarian tone into their discourse. The idea that the whole pandemic is some sort of hoax, just like they believe the election to be, has invited fascist extremists into what we recently called the mainstream currents of republicanism, who brought with them their horrifying views of what politics should be. Fascists, and more generally awful far-right extremists, are welcomed into the republican fold. But in making this video, I want to be careful that it doesn't seem like this is something new. It's certainly very bad, much more explicit today than it has been in years, and tainted with a much more military and violent shade than before. But fascism in this country has existed in some way for decades, if not centuries. The conservative wing of the American political establishment, often joined in its mission by the more progressive wing with only a few years of delay, has found in its electorate enough political will to push forward nationalism, xenophobia, racism, and the glorification of white religious culture at the very least since the Reagan era. And this country as a whole has engaged in genocidal racial violence for the majority of its history. It has always embraced more authoritarian, less democratic rule. It has always glorified its hegemonic role in the international sphere. It has always, in part or in whole, condoned its national project against racial and religious minorities and against every political movement to its left. The Capitol riots, Charlottesville a couple years ago, moments like these were significant. They were marks of the change in fascism's presentation, but by no means were they catalyst of fascism or flukes we can easily ignore. Because even if we understand the kinds of narratives that bring fascist ideology into a more prominent role today, those narratives are still just the last step before mainstream acceptance. Their emergence in far-right cells and compatibility with the greater conservative currents had to come from somewhere, and they did. Today, fascism has been driven to its current apex not by those narratives alone, but by the failures of the neoliberal era. Failures that have been building for decades and that have laid a fertile ground for fascism to take root. The economic insecurity that has fallen on more and more shoulders. The general decline of unionized labor. The disappearance of jobs that entire cities were built on. And the increasing pace of economic crises have resulted in a particularly unstable system that fewer and fewer people have faith in. That has opened up the space for opportunistic figures all too happy to make sure the capitalist economy endures even if it means a descent into authoritarian ultranationalism. Figures who have tried to portray moments like the Trump presidency as a departure from what brought us here in the first place, when it was really just a natural next step for a fragile, crisis-ridden capitalist economy. That's so dumb. That makes no sense. How could that be? That's you. That's what you're saying right now. I can hear you. I can see you. I yep. 100%. Yep. Uh, how could that be? I do not believe it. I know you're confused. If only you had an ongoing 12-part series on fascism and its modern forms to help you understand it better. Oh, wait, you do. You can watch the first episode of my series, The New F-Word, on Nebula. We're working on the next episode as we speak, so stay tuned for that. I'm really proud of what we've produced so far. First In episode meantime, was amazing. If you'd like to help support content like this and my very time-consuming fascism series, consider becoming a patron on Patreon. As you can probably imagine, when I made the switch to producing political content, I started getting demonetized way more often, and most of my sponsors bailed. It's understandable, but because of this, I'm having to rely more heavily on viewers like you. If you like the kind of videos I'm producing, and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate the support. As a little show of that appreciation, every patron, regardless of donation amount, gets early access to every video, plus access to our patrons-only Discord server. We actually just dropped a major update to the Discord, and there are some really cool new features. We've got everything from a recommended reading list, to a book club, to special channels for our neurodivergent and LGBT comrades. We also have fun medal rolls for people who complete the server challenges. We've built a great little community, and we'd love for you to be part of it. So, if you'd like to help support my channel, join the Discord, and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash secondthought. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. 
You can check out my previous videos by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week. That was weird. Good game in of, uh... I always get wrecked as Bianca. I get a game in of Eternal Return. And then I'm gonna hop off and be back on uh, with Tabletop Tuesday. I'm not gonna be playing tonight, thankfully. Because there's an amazing lineup of people that are gonna be on. Of community members with rep um, really looking forward to that but we'll be back at 8 p.m. Eastern 7 Central 6 5 Mountain Pacific respectively respectfully respectively but in the meantime gameplay button all that tip literally just saw a tip that said you can press x to rest to regain health and stamina i'm to rest in this game so this game is a survival battle royale um but with uh very moba type elements genre which is really interesting. Uh, gameplay is really fun. So we're looking for flowers, pickaxe, I had to get that hunting accessory. I got a two for one there. In fact, that worked out for my benefit. Like, I think that's the first lag spike I've dealt with. Crafting some stuff. Now I'm looking to collect get Saints Relic. I'm just starting to learn like the flow of this game. My day playing it. I tried it out a little bit over the weekend. Probably messed up my combo someplace in there. Like I think I should have had that kill. Um, but it was an an easy harassment. 
What do I need for this? I'm looking for a flower still. Flower and a lighter? Get that gold. Still looking for a pickaxe. Still looking for a flower. Would have found that already. Go. We got the relic. Nice. Another cross someplace in here. I need a cross. I need another cross for. Uh... There it is. Found it. We're moving out from here. Definitely need to get some new boots. Still don't have boots. But. Boots and a lighter. Or a flower, a lighter, and some. Both. It appears to be something useful. Looks like a fashion icon. A special fashion icon. I think I need to be over in school. I'm starting to lean on. Pickaxe. I'm I am geared
right, so I am looking, currently looking for I think I need to go over to the school. Don't get her. I just don't get that character. Alright. I'm gonna get one in with uh, a Yarby, hopefully. I didn't even see what place I came in. I came in 10th. Meh. Losing the greedy bastards running U.S. foreign policy, breaking points with Crystal and Sagar. Hmm. I haven't Joining seen this now, yet. Great friend Check of the show, out. Richard Hanania. He is out with a new book, Public Choice Theory and the Illusion of Grand Strategy. Richard's been a great source of this show, particularly during the Afghanistan debacle. There was one story we wanted to get his take on, but also to talk about his book. So let's put that up there on the screen. Who won in Afghanistan? Well, it's private contractors who, it turns out, netted trillions of dollars while they were over there. Richard, talk to us a little bit about that and tie it to your fantastic book, which very thank you very much, by the way, for sending it to us. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my book argues, you know, I've been studying international relations uh, sort of as, as you guys are as just a consumer of the news, but also in an, uh, as, uh, academically. And so I've read, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, the all the important thinkers in international relations, the theories about what we're supposedly doing overseas. And I think I think that, you know, it, it just came to the conclusion that people are basically thinking about the whole thing wrong, whether they think the U.S. Uh, should have a prominent role in world affairs, whether they I think that the problem is, you know, we think that there there's actually somebody in charge, that there is a grand strategy where uh, sort of like wise men are sitting around and sort of determining what the U.S. should be doing about Afghanistan, about Iraq, about the rise of China, uh, about any any number of things. And, you know, I don't think that that's actually what's happening. I think that we're I think the Af I think Afghanistan is such a good way to sort of introduce people to the rest of what foreign policy is like, because the uh, because the mistakes and the blunders and the sort of disastrous the 
how disastrous it is and and the, the waste and everything else i mean it's just so obvious and it's so mm-hmm. clear it's been like that for for 20 years um so yeah that money i mean that money in afghanistan uh, the 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 war of afghanistan just like the war in iraq the money runs into the uh, the spending runs into the trillions a lot of it was government contractors and the government contractors would do everything from build you know build girls girls schools to uh supply the uh u.s bases uh to you know uh to provide security and these people got very very wealthy i mean these these people the these people are one of the reasons why uh washington dc has now um has now all the basically every single one of the uh wealthiest counties in the country are around washington dc yeah, i mean right. th- this this is these people who made money off of Afghanistan, who made money off Iraq. We left Afghanistan, and uh, the same people are in charge. Are in charge as they as they. Fifty five percent. Fifty five percent of the bloated military spending budget. They were when we when we originally went in, um, but yeah, I think foreign policy. I mean, I think it demonstrates that foreign policy is working. I mean, you can look at Iraq too. You say, what did we get? What did we gain out of Iraq? Well, it didn't work. You know, there's 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 uh, no actual tangible benefit you can point to for the American people there. Um, but go, you know, look up every single person who was involved in the Iraq war. What are they doing now? They're not they're not in jail. They're not uh, they're not uh, they haven't suffered any financial harm. Wolfowitz went on to lead the World Bank. Uh, some of yeah. them are at the Hudson, Hudson Institute where people still tell us about what we should do on foreign policy next. Uh Take no prisoners, opinion. January 11th, Afghanistan is in meltdown and the U.S. is helping speed it up. By Laurel Miller. When the United States withdrew from Afghanistan last summer, it was left with a critical choice. Allow the collapse of a state that had been mostly been kept afloat by foreign aid or work with the Taliban, its former foes who were in power to prevent that outcome. More than four months after the last U.S. military flight left Kabul, the Biden administration has yet to take a clear decision, opting to muddle along with half measures amid an escalating humanitarian crisis. Time is running out. The United States should swallow the bitter pill of working with the Taliban-led government in order to prevent a failed state in Afghanistan. Kneecapping the government through the sanctions and frozen aid won't change the fact that the Taliban are now in charge, but it will ensure the ordinary public services. But it will ensure that ordinary public services collapse, the economy decays, and Afghan livelihoods shrink even further. Not in the interest of anyone, right? So, like. If we do not do something, if we do not help the people, right, which was the entire precedent, like the entire reason we're there is to help people. If we're not helping them, right, after the, like our military didn't help them while they were there, we didn't establish anything. We didn't actually build infrastructure for the people to take over. We gave them a military industrial complex. We built up their police forces. We built up ANCAP. We didn't build up communities being able to, like, build up their farming. We took over their land and set up FOBs in the middle of farm sustainable farming crops. We didn't empower community aid and mutual aid and give them a, an electrical grid or anything like that. We didn't talk to them as indigenous people in charge of their own land. We gave them a standing military. That, that was completely propped up by our the overall private mil, private military contractors, the military industrial complex. And now we've pulled out and we're saying that we're only going to fight there in over the horizon warfare. So we're going to continue the police state and 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 have kill, continue to kill civilians with 90% of our drone strikes. Um and while the military, the U.S. military won't have a boots on ground presence, but private military contractors can and will are there. Which is 55% of the, the Pentagon spending. You have a military that's made up of mercenaries. That's what that tells me. Anyway. That's not in the interest of anyone, including the United States. After 20 years of investment and engagement, a failed state would be fertile ground for extremist groups to thrive, with little room for the West to work with the government, no matter how imperfectly, to prevent further threats. 
Afghans are already on a countdown to calamity. Their cash-based economy is starved for current starved of currency. Hunger and malnutrition are growing. Civil servants are largely unpaid, and essential services are in tatters. No one, like honestly, I thought they were talking about the United States with the pandemic response to Omicron and what's going on right now. I, how can I expect the world's number one superpower in decline um, to clean up after its mess and 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 actually handle the humanitarian interests of another place? Um, how could I expect that? Got ahead of myself there. My fault. Uh, it's no surprise that the United States and its allies responded to the Taliban takeover with punitive measures, halting the flow of the aid they've been paying for three-fourths of public spending, freezing Afghan state and assets abroad, cutting the country off from the global financial system, and maintaining sanctions on the Taliban, which now penalize the entire government they head. That playbook is how Washington typically tries to punish objectionable regimes, but the result has been catastrophic for civilians. And there's there's a reason why that's um what they the this this the game that they're going towards, right? There's uh there's it it perpetuates the system. It gives them a reason to go back in in a couple years, right? Like it keeps the war machine viable, gives them a, a boogeyman to look back at and to justify increased spending with roughly 55% of that spending going to private hands for failed projects like the F-35 or electric Tesla-made Humvees that will fail. Um, remote pilot human machine interface tanks, which they're planning on putting together the largest company-sized uh, battle simulation with them within the next year like that's what that it's going to it's not going to actually stabilizing and treating material conditions or actually ending war it is perpetuating war for the sake of the war machine devastating droughts the pandemic and taliban's incompetence in governing have all played roles in creating what may be the worst world's worst humanitarian crisis but the West's immediate steps to isolate the new regime triggered Afghanistan's meltdown. This was especially the case because the countries that shut off the aid spigot had over 20 years and enabled the Afghan state's dependency on it. Isolation was fast and easy to do. It cost no money or political capital and satisfied the imperative of expressing disapproval. Once again, I am pointing at our own nation being a super spreader. We are the reason that the pandemic is continuing. And, and societal collapse is occurring. With aid organizations raising ever more desperate alarms, the United States and other Western nations have taken incremental steps to help Afghans by trying to work around the Taliban. Funding for emergency aid delivered by the United Nations and humanitarian organizations has grown, with Washington providing the largest share, nearly $474 million in 2021. U.S. government had also has gradually broadened humanitarian carve-outs from its sanctions and has taken the lead in getting the Security Council to issue exemptions from U.N. sanctions, making it easier for those delivering aid to carry out the work without legal risk. Our sanctions make it so we can't do humanitarian aid. So the U.N., the rest of the world, is not allowed to go do stuff. If I'm reading that correct, hold on, let's see. With aid organizations raising ever more desperate alarms. I'm going to run. I'm going to try Bianco again. All right. With aid organizations raising ever more desperate alarms, the United States and other Western nations have taken incremental steps to help Afghans after trying to work around the Taliban. Funding for emergency aid delivered by the United Nations and humanitarian organizations has grown, with Washington providing the largest share, nearly $474 million in 2021. The U.S. government has also gradually broadened humanitarian carve-outs from its sanctions and has taken the lead in, get, in getting the Security Council to issue exemptions from U.N. sanctions, making it easier for those delivering aid to carry out the work without legal risk. Why is there legal risk in helping human beings survive? 
why why did we okay so we've we provided the largest share nearly 474 million there's 474 million when we just added 28 billion to the war budget even though we came out of a war we stopped the war we, we increased our spending yeah that's is that how that's supposed to work I'm confused. Like that that shit confuses me. Just saying, just saying like if we were serious about actually handling the fallout of a 20-year war in Afghanistan um we would uh maybe like put some of those billions into there to fix the issues to help the diaspora, to help refugees. It, it's aggravating. All right, so I rushed I rushed through my temple area got all my items I'm hoping to be able to make some stuff right now. That's a weapon upgrade. That's a big upgrade right there That actually worked out really well for me and a shoe upgrade Oh, I can't even make the shoe I can go through walls with that. That's good to know. I scared them off, luckily. Oh, there's a lighter. Look at that. Purple shoes already. A big upgrade. Go. Let's go. There. I gotta start using that ability more. Power. Third upgrade. I'm in blues. I'm playing a vampire. What of it?
got our first cross. One more. Got purple weapon. Alright, now I just need another. There's uh are stacked right now gear wise uh, I'm looking for I just need some water I need a bottle of water it looks like bottle of water and some ice How did I not pick up a bottle any place? Oh no. That's not I'm I'm literally looking for water right now. Oh, I know where I can get it. Up that wall. I'm looking for some ice. There it is. Archery range? Cool. Be school. Not school. Avenue? Factory. It's factory and dock, I guarantee.
get this two for one right here. I'm full built.
All right, I ended on third. And with that, quiet there. Uh, went over a couple things. Thanks for joining. Uh, thanks for joining uh, this little little stream, this little news break stream, going over some good uh, content that some of the other people in the the community at large, you know, the people that are you know looking like they're Leonardo DiCaprio and and uh, Emma Watson and uh, don't look up that was Emma Watson, right? Why am I? Hold on. Don't look. Why am I? That please tell me. No, Jennifer Lawrence. Oh my god. I, rich people. Whatever. Um, Jennifer Lawrence and Leonardo DiCaprio. There's a lot of us out there that are feeling kind of like that right now, especially in the peace movement. Looking at the uh, the war machine and yelling about it and its impact on the climate crisis impact on on violent extremism in the united states the 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 link between the failed pandemic response and the military budget you know there, so much is going on and there's so many people out there uh thanks for joining um we'll be back eight o'clock tonight eastern with uh tabletop tuesday we have a uh, good old rep rep doing the uh dming tonight it'll be awesome but really looking forward to it and actually then. In the meantime, remember peace is possible. <laughs>